Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, Mitt Romney makes a dramatic announcement that could have a generational impact on our state. As the nation faces critical issues, Utah's leaders weigh in. And new polling reveals what voters are thinking ahead of the 2024 election cycle. Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Ben Winslow, reporter with Fox 13 News, Sage Miller, reporter with KUER, and Frank Pignanelli, political commentator and lobbyist with Foxley and Pignanelli. So glad you were with us tonight because this was a huge week in politics. The ramifications will be felt for a very long time and we're just getting to those details. Ben, let's start with you. Senator Mitt Romney made the announcement. We were waiting to know that he's not running for a second term. It was both a surprise and yet at the same time, it was not a surprise. We kind of, you know, we were playing this game for a long time. Will he, yeah, won't yeah. he? Will he, won't he? And he finally did. He ripped the Band-Aid off. And yeah, this is uh, shockwaves from D.C. to Utah. But at the same time, everybody was kind of expecting it, too. It's, it's weird when I talk to people about that. People are like, I still can't believe he did it, but I was not surprised that he did it. Uh -huh. Sage, it's, it's interesting because uh, he made this announcement at a time when his approval ratings are at a three-year high. Republicans were, were asked whether or not they would vote for him, and you know, at least 50 percent of them thought, said that they would if he were to run again. It's an interesting time, and why now? I think because of his age, he doesn't really necessarily want to be in the nitty gritty of Washington, D.C. anymore. And he says that he wants in the announcement that he made when he said that he was not going to seek reelection, that he wanted the, the, the generation, a younger generation to actually lead instead of him being in his 80s by the next time uh, he would be running again for reelection. Yeah. So he didn't. He kind of, I think he just wants to enjoy the remaining years of his life, and he wants younger folks in a position uh, to actually lead the nation, considering they will be the ones that are alive uh, and making these big decisions. So he does want to see the next generation very much so take the torch. Uh, and I like, was reading this article that by uh, next year, by the next election, 50 percent of the electoral, like 50 uh, percent of the, the, the vote is going to be Gen Z and millennials. Yeah. So we are seeing this shift in who uh, needs to be in Washington representing the folks that uh, are going to be alive <laughs> and yeah. be like seeking the repercussions of their decisions and yeah. their votes in Washington. Uh, to this point, Frank, I want to show a clip first to what Sage was just talking about, too, on this passing the torch and who should be making the decisions, that being the people who are going to be alive at the time when, they're, when the true ramifications are felt. Let's show this clip from Senator Romney and then your reaction. I think it's time for guys like me to get out of the way and have people in the next generation step forward because they're going to be shaping the world they're going to be living in. And over the last um, a couple of decades, people of my age, the boomers, have done pretty well for ourselves. We voted for all sorts of benefits and programs for us, and we haven't paid for them. And uh, I think some of the people that are coming along next want to have a say in, uh, in how we, uh, we leave the earth and how they prepare for the, the future they're going to live in. Well, first of all, an important lesson we all learned. Do not play poker with Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because up until a week ago, people who knew him said, oh, well, absolutely, he's going to run, or others said, no, he's not going to run. I mean, he held the card so close to his chest and yet sent out different signals. So was that what I found it fascinating that he did, and obviously he'd been thinking about it from before. I think what he's trying to do is establish what it, part of his legacy is that he's done some great accomplishments, but also he's leaving for the next generation. But let's be honest, he was in for a fight, and I think that he, this is a, a, a graceful way to say I'm leaving because. And he mentioned President uh, Trump, and he mentioned President Biden, and obviously just also talk about the age. The, this the, the discussion about passing the torch is a way for him to leave grace because otherwise he was facing a tough battle. It may have prevailed, but it was going to be tough hand-to-hand mm -hmm. -to -hand combat between now 
and June. Mm -hmm. But what do you make of the, the sort of the names you just threw out some of them, whether or not this narrative is going to continue nationally? So you talk, he mentioned Trump and he mentioned Biden, but part of this discussion is McConnell and Pelosi, for example. Some of these elected officials that are getting up there in age, and he's kind of referencing those as well. Is that a narrative we're going to continue to see? I think it is a narrative you're going to continue to see because, as was pointed out, is that you have this new wave of voters coming in, the Gen Z and the millennials, and they have they have no affiliation at all with these older politicians, and so and, and it's across the and so it's it's Democrats and Republicans that are they're clinging on to this, and they don't have that connection to these younger voters. So I think you're going to see a new rash of voters there. So. You do, the people are talked about are younger people that to replace Romney. I think he saw that and was gonna, he's gonna have, he was gonna have to figure that out. How do I have a connection with the younger voter? It just wasn't worth it, I'm moving on. I do wonder how much burnout's gonna play into a factor of that too. As he goes, he was considering potentially a reelection, like you said, he was gonna face a, a intra-party fight and it was going to be vicious. Convention, he likely would not have prevailed. He has been famously booed at the state Republican Party convention. Likely would have gathered signatures, likely would would have made the ballot, you know, potentially could have definitely done very well. But there were a lot of people lining up to challenge him. There are a lot of people lining up right now, and this was before he made the announcement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to look at this through the lens of some of our students and Sage. We have a question from one of our students here on campus, Karina, who is looking at this very issue of potential voter in the future, and this is what she's wondering about. So let's listen to, to this question and then your answer. Hello, my name is Karina Barker, and I am a senior at the University of Utah studying political science and international studies. It has recently been announced that Senator Romney is not running for re-election for the Senate to make room for the next generation of leaders in this country. And my question is, what do you think Senator Romney's lasting legacy will be? I think Romney <laughs> has a very long resume. He was a governor, he ran for president, and now he's the senator of Utah. He has a lot to look forward to in saying what he has accomplished. He prides himself on running a lot of clean elections. A lot of people couldn't dig up dirt on him, which uh, t t worked out in his favor a lot of the time. And I also think that his legacy, while it could be divisive in some ends, is known for sticking to his guns and like voting with his mind and what he believes is right. Um, I know the Atlantic just came out with an article, uh, McKay Choppins is writing a like a book about Mitt Romney, and it, like in that article, it explains just how how hard it was for him to come to the decision to not only vote to impeach President Trump, but also just his feelings around the attack on the Capitol on January 6th and how he felt mm -hmm. ostracized by his own party and recognized that there just wasn't a lot of unity and there was a lot of people having a performance on the front side, but then saying something behind closed doors, which didn't necessarily align with what President Trump at the time was saying. And so I think that he is going to be known very much so for doing what he believes in and what he is like what he believes is right and not going along with the performance or sticking along party lines to play the game of politics. But he did his own thing. He yeah, really he did. did. He voted on bills that bucked his own party, the impeachments of President Trump twice. And maybe that factored into the decision as well because the party has changed on him. He was the flag bearer for president in 2012. The party is not the same party that when he was leading it and on the ticket. Now, as he made reference to, uh, you know, President Trump, he called uh, certain factions of the party demagogues. You know, he threw all that out there in his uh, kind of setting fire and walking away uh, speech, uh, announcing he was leaving, or at least his news conference there. The party has changed on him as well, and you kind of wonder uh, how much did he want to be a part of that going forward. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I think, it kind of taking a, a more broader view, is that he was essentially drafted and then coronated when he when he first ran. He walks in with all this political capital. Now, a lot of politicians who are popular, all they do is they want to protect their political capital. I think he's going to be a good instruction for future generations of politicians that you can have your political capital and you can spend it and you can do some things. I go back to D.C. a lot, interact with all the different lobbyists and elected officials. They like working with him. And that's why he was able to accomplish a lot. Both Democrats, Republicans liked working with him. So he was able to spend his political capital to get some important things passed. And that, to me, sets a good legacy that you can, you know, you can walk in the political, you walk with great political capital, and if you don't just try to preserve it, but spend it, you can accomplish great things. Right. Sage, what's interesting uh, in this speech, uh, when he had made his announcement, uh, Senator Romney said, I'm not gonna be running again, but I'm going to stay active 
politically. Does this political capital that he brought with him uh, extend a little further, given who he is? I definitely think that he's not leaving politics for sure. This man is like, he's always going. I don't I don't feel like he could just like retire and go play golf. I feel like he still wants to be in the fight, just maybe not in the front of it anymore. I don't think he really wants to be a part of very strong headlines. I think that he wants to be uh, behind the doors, helping use that political capital to maybe perhaps grow the next generation of Republican politicians that is away from Trumpism. I definitely think he wants to move on from this era and then get back to essentially to the basics of what it means to be an establishment Republican. So I definitely don't know exactly what that looks like. I think this race uh, to replace him is going to show a lot about where exactly Utah is going to be postured within uh, within Washington, D.C., especially because it's a very young delegation now. The the oldest serving person is going to be Mike Lee. He probably has the most like gumption up at the Capitol right now. But yeah, Celeste Malloy uh, or the race with Celeste Malloy uh, against Kathleen Reby, like that's going to be a new a new face. Um, uh, Burgess Owens is pretty new. So is is Blake Moore. So it's it's definitely like Utah is losing something there when it comes to a strong voice on in, in Washington. Um, and well, we'll he's going to have to. Share Shape to see where that voice remains. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to bring up a, an item that Sage mentioned a moment ago for you, Frank, because it's interesting. Is there is an article in the Atlantic from McKay Coppins uh, who uh, gives us a little teaser of a book, a biography that he has been has been writing with the help of Senator Romney. Give, give us a little preview of what we're going to find. And some say that was maybe one of the real signs that Senator Romney wasn't going to run again. Is that this book is about to come out? Well, I read a, a preview of it, and I definitely think that's. One of the reasons why he's decided to run. I mean, he just took the hand grenade and tossed it. And I get it was a bipartisan, uh, I don't want to say attack, but a critique of what happens in the Senate and, you know, his frustration with different senators who felt like who weren't fulfilling their obligations. But also he's, you know, he talks about how he's able to piece together different things. He also talked about his life, how yeah. he would eat salmon that Senator Mikowski brought and watch <laughs> Ted Lasso. <laughs> it is like this awful but life he had. His family wouldn't visit him because yeah. they didn't want to be in yeah. Washington. Like this <laughs> awful life. And so, but, but I do think what he does, he talks about the back room of how they, the senators would laugh at uh, President Trump and things like that. He was frustrated with the uh, progressivism of the, of the Democrats. So I do think what it is is like I'm leaving, but I, I want to make sure that when I leave, everyone knows what it was like. And, and hopefully it will set the standard of what people can do to change. Uh -huh. What's well, interesting? Oh, go ahead, Sage. Yeah, like, I think also too is that Romney was really kind of having this reckoning of what like what it means to be a Republican, specifically on a high level in Washington. And part of the expert ex uh, excerpt that we were reading as well is like states that he was working with Joe, Man uh, Joe Manchin of West Virginia to perhaps create a third party because he was just like so sick of the divisiveness and didn't believe that the, any of the colleagues were really following the Constitution or even believed in it to begin with. And so he he was he was under a lot of turmoil at least. At least that's what it sounds like in this book, uh, in the excerpt of this book, this book that I actually now want to read because it was written really well what I did <laughs> read. And I just I just I think that he he wants to do something more. But I don't think he wants to be necessarily in the thick of it. Yeah, it's interesting. We'll be reading that with some interest. Anytime you have a, a, a snippet that says a quote is morons, I'm surrounded by morons, which which, which is part of this little teaser we get to see. It's going to be interesting to read that book, uh, but, which leads us to this very interesting question, Ben, because you've done such great reporting on this, too, is everyone's wondering now who's going to replace him. Let's talk about that for a moment. Are you? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity there, uh, Ben. The name was floated, uh, but no, there's a long list of people, and I think it's growing by the day. Uh, the Utah GOP chair said that previous to Romney's announcement, he had received 10 to 15 calls feeling out chances. And then you have uh, a couple more after Romney announced. Mm -hmm. And and I have been making calls trying to find out who yeah. is and who is not. Obviously, you have some people, some high profile names who are not. Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes yeah. told me he is not. Greg Hughes, former House Speaker, told me he is not. Carolyn Fippen told me she is interested. Um, you also have uh, Congressman John Curtis mm -hmm. uh, kind of putting it out there. Little maybe, flirt. maybe yeah, not. A little, little, flirt. little light yeah. flirting going on there with the uh -huh. Senate race. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of people. You also have, obviously, Riverton Mayor Trent Staggs, who is mm -hmm. already in, and House Speaker Brad Wilson, who has the Exploratory Committee, which he's very much fundraising and very much 
pushing toward a run. And on that one, I'm not sure if he's going to even be speaker by the time January hits because he may just jump in. Yeah, hey, talk about that one for a minute, Frank, because uh, Brad Wilson, the Speaker of the House, launched this exploratory committee. He was, he, he kind of walked that line waiting for the announcement from Senator Romney, but now that he's made it, what do you expect is going to happen? Oh, he'll there? announce in the next two weeks. <clears throat> he's going to announce that he's resigning from the legislature and then he's, he's in. And he's raised over $2 million. He has put an incredible amount of time meeting with local elected officials and things like that. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, the two, I don't want to say front runners, but uh, because you have John Curtis, who actually, you know, obviously would be a viable candidate. But the two that have been out there working are local elected officials. You have Brad Wilson, who's been, who's been a member of the legislature. You've had Trent Staggs, who's been uh, obviously the mayor of Riverton. And I think what we learned from the race, the special election, is that the local election officials, actually, their endorsements play a lot. And these two candidates have been working it. Now, Brad Wilson really has been working very hard with his legislative contacts, and which could, could be very helpful to him in, a, in not just a delegate fight, but also in a primary fight, with the, which is likely to happen. So if Brad Wilson's in, Trent Stadz is in, and we're going to wait for some others. You could have, I think you'd have up to 10 to, to 12 candidates in this thing. What's likely to happen with that speaker position? Position. Not, not who's going to fill it, but what Brad Wilson will likely do. Brad Wilson will resign from the speakership in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the, the most likely uh, talked about is Mike Schultz, who's, ma who's the majority leader, will move up, which will create a position in Republican leadership. And let me tell you, they've already been working on that for the last month or two. Uh, there's a lot of people vying for that. So yeah. you will have a, a change in the House leadership for the 2024 session. Mm -hmm. so there are ramifications of this for sure. Uh, I, I want to talk about the one, the name that uh, several of you mentioned here, which is interesting, is Congressman John Curtis. You said he was kind of flirting with this. I want to, I want to give the tweet that he put out and Sage, maybe you can comment on this after we, we show it, uh, because this is his uh, kind of thought that we, he might be interested in it, but he also wants to make sure his, his house race is secure. So here's what Congressman Curtis tweeted. He said, it's encouraging to hear from friends urging me to run for Senate. Sue and I are grateful for Utah's trust. Your appreciation for the work my team and I do in Congress is heartening, be it in the House or Senate. There's much to accomplish, and I look forward to getting things done. The first thing that sticks out to me is that it looks like he's definitely staying in Washington or at least going to try and secure a seat in Washington, whether that be in the House yeah. or in the Senate. But I do think that the House is uh, going through a lot right now, and they, de <laughs> to put it lightly. That's putting it very Yeah, mildly. putting it very lightly <laughs> of where you have this division within the Republican Party in the House. You have the Freedom Caucus, and then you have the folks that are not a part of the Freedom Caucus but are still Republican. And he is just watching this all unfold. It's really dramatic. It's incredibly chaotic and perhaps he's hoping that like the Senate might be a little bit more tame or he can get a little bit more mm -hmm. done but he would also be bringing that experience that already exists into the Senate he's already had those relationships he understands how Washington works and so if he were to run for the Senate I do think he'd be an incredibly viable candidate and I, I would actually like to see the mm -hmm. race play out between him and Brad Wilson mm -hmm. uh, b before we leave it one one thing's interesting you talked about Sean Ray is telling you he's not going to run but he did say he would be announcing his support for someone very soon Soon. It didn't sound like us, some of those names we just talked about. No, uh, there's certainly a lot of internet rumor going around that Tim Ballard, Sound of Freedom, Operation Underground Rescue, Railroad, railroad, yeah. uh, ra railroad um, that could be a name that shows up, um, could be a wild card in this race. Uh, that film got a lot of buzz, got a lot of, has a certain faction that very much mm -hmm. supports it. So that could be a thing. I've also heard Lieutenant Governor Deidre Henderson's name floated mm -hmm. as a potential candidate. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, heard those names. Boyd Matheson, potentially, another name we know in politics. We'll watch that one very closely. And of course, one of the issues that will come up for whoever decides to run for this office is, uh, Frank, an interesting thing happened in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, an impeachment investigation. Talk about what's happening right there when it comes to the Biden administration. Well, obviously, articles of impeachment were not uh, voted on by the whole House, which is usually what happens. The whole House votes to begin the impeachment process. Uh, Nancy Pelosi did not go that route in 2019, so although McCarthy is being attacked for just opening up the mm -hmm. inquiry, Pelosi did the same thing in 2019, which is they didn't have... She didn't have the votes for the impeachment investigation, and he doesn't either. So that's why they're just doing this inquiry, which probably will lead to a vote on this. And uh, you've heard from Romney and others. A lot, of, a lot of senators are saying there's not enough there. We hope we don't get this because we don't think there's anything there. The problem is this. I'm a federally 
registered lobbyist. I'm a state registered lobbyist. And the, the, the reason why I think this is catching attention, not just in Washington, but across the country, there was a poll out there. Majority of Americans, they, they think there's something there. The reason why there's so much smoke is because you have a, a relative of the president who was selling his relationship with the president to foreign governments. If somebody else tried that, someone like me tried that, we would be crucified. And so there is this perception, at least amongst the political class, mm -hmm. that he's getting a separate treatment. Now, he, he may not have done anything illegal, and I'm not saying he has, but it's certainly unethical because you are saying that you have this relationship and you can make you can have an influence on domestic uh, affairs and so that's why this keeps on going is because there is a sense of it's something's wrong not just with Congress but the American people are sensing it so that's what's driving this and, with, and then you don't have really good messaging from the White House he keeps on saying my son's done nothing wrong well he has he was going to sign you know a plea deal so so the messaging's off here so that's why you see this machinations happening and they better figure out their messaging because otherwise it's going to haunt them as they go into the re-election campaign. Yeah, so to that point, Sage, Hunter Biden did get indicted uh, just this Thursday uh, by federal prosecutors. Yeah, he did. And I think that perhaps that would help the impeachment inquiry if they go along with it. But I think the most important aspect of this is that the inquiry is opened with a very no evidence was really found yet. They're kind of just prodding. And additionally, we know that McCarthy is kind of at the will of a freedom ca at the Freedom Caucus to keep his job, essentially. So I think a lot of this is a kind of posturing, and we've been through this before, twice with Trump, and I think that now it, the idea of an impeachment, the, the, the impression and the power of it is dwindling a little bit. It kind of just seems like politics, if I'm being honest, and I, I don't think that a lot of the American people are gonna tune into it. I don't think a lot of American people are gonna give a lot of weight to it, and I think that, uh, it's just it just it just seems kind of like another line that's showing the division in Washington. Uh, uh, just the, the final note on this one, Ben, is uh, some of our delegation have weighed in. Um, Senator Mike Lee was supporting of the, uh, the investigation. Um, we, we had um, uh, we, we, we had uh, Representative Owens uh, weigh in quite quickly, but also we had Mitt Romney say, I don't see anything to it, but you're okay to proceed. And Congressman Curtis also kind of said, I'll just wait and see what mm -hmm. happens. But yeah, uh, stay tuned, really. Yeah. This is going to be interesting. I do think this is going to be a big factor going into the presidential election. And you might even see some trickle down effects here locally in our races. But yeah. Remember, in the 21st century, the three the, the impeachment proceedings that were initiated by the party in power loses power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting bit of history right there. Starting, starting 1998, yes, exactly. T uh, talking about tr uh, trickle-down um, impacts, uh, Sage, uh, the Republicans in Washington, D.C. seem to be saying right now they're, they're going to avoid a government shutdown by the end of this month. Yeah, uh, they do this every time. It just feels like the same dream that we haven't woken up yet from. And I do think that if Republicans, specifically those running for president right now, are talking a lot about fiscal responsibility, that uh, we are overspending and then kind of just dragging the horse down the road and not doing anything about it probably is not fixing this problem of our national debt and our deficit. So I do think it's also interesting because Chris Stewart, his last day is today uh, yes. in Washington, and that's a pretty big vote. And he was kind of needed to avoid a government shutdown shutdown and now that seat's going to be vacant for about two and a half months and right there's or, a lot like, of votes yeah. that uh, w that might be needed for the house that are not going to be there now with uh, congressman stewart's mm -hmm. absence and so and i don't think that they re like necessarily recognize a big vote like a government spending bill would would necessarily matter by the time or like be in front of them by the time that Chris Stewart uh, did, was was stepping down. And I do think it kind of just puts us a little bit in limbo. We have we have gone through this before and usually it's evaded at the very last second or they push it a little bit, do some posturing, do some negotiating and then the government's open again. I think the last like long shutdown we have was when it was with Trump and didn't our, our national parks were also impacted they by were. that, correct? And Utah floated the bill to keep them open. Yes. They did. But we never got paid back, by the way. <laughs> And no one like I mean, look, you have millions of Americans who go to work on October 1, and if the government shut down, they get frustrated. It's like, we, can't, we know you care about the debt, but why can't you talk about it other times of the year and not shut the government down? Mm -hmm. It never helps 
both parties, Washington, D.C., to, to, to shut the government down because it impacts people. And they have to go to work, and they get frustrated when they don't see their elected officials working. Mm -hmm. Let's we'll spend the last uh, couple of minutes on an initiative from our governor. This gets to the more kind of getting along area of politics. Uh, ben, this Disagree Better initiative. Uh, governor Cox, our own governor, is the chair of the National Governor Association. This is the primary initiative. But this week, it wasn't just about how do we get along better. They're also tackling a tough federal issue. Immigration. <laughs> no <laughs> yes. small issue there, yeah. right? Um, this kind of speaks toward the, the Utah way that we hear a lot about of, you know, finding ways to find common ground, kind of move policies forward. I mean, Utah has had its own compact on immigration uh, that's had bipartisan buy-in and things like that. And it, I think it appears that the governor would like to see if that can translate to a national stage with this whole idea of finding things, finding ways to move forward by finding ways that you can disagree without being necessarily um, scorched earth on everybody else. It, it's an interesting initiative. It is very Utah-like and it is very on brand for Governor Cox. I, I do wonder in these very hyper-partisan times how it translates, if it can really get that momentum on a national uh -huh. scale. You can tell there's a certain segment of the population that would like to see this happen, would like to be able to talk to their neighbors without everybody you know, tearing each other apart. Yeah. But you just wonder if it is also, is it too late? Have we past the point of no return. Frank, uh, as our one elected official here, formerly elected official, uh, it was interesting at this, at this conference in this last 20 seconds, Rachel Kleinfeld from Carnegie Endowment said, when polarization becomes a winning political strategy, democracy fails. It just, I don't know if it fails, but it just makes it that much harder. Mm -hmm. And because the because vast majority of the population, whether it's inside Utah or it's across the country, they don't like they don't they don't like the the, the the fights. They just want to get things done. And I will say this: it, it's that democracy is built on argument. You're always going to have an argument. And when someone says we need to bring the people together, Americans never come together unless it's in times of crisis or emergency. We're always arguing with each other, and that and it tells me it's a healthy democracy. So I'm glad we're going to be. I think we should be nicer to each other, but we need to keep arguing. Okay. Thank you so much for that insight and the way we had that last conversation. It's very important. So thank you, and thank you. For for watching The Hinkley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.